morning everyone on the behalf of team dental channel online i would like to extend a very warm welcome to all of you i am dr aditi mishra and i'll be the host for today's session on the topic radiographic diagnosis by dr huda nisar so before starting with the session i have few housekeeping notes to make if you have any doubts during the session you can put your questions in the question and answer box and we'll be answering them at the end of the session If you have joined us from Facebook and YouTube live, you can ask us questions by commenting, and we'll be answering them at the end of the session. So, uh, without further ado, I would like to introduce our today's speaker to everyone. Dr. Huda has completed her BDS in the year two thousand and twenty-one, and has been really consistent with the clinical aspects and practice. She has a keen interest in the theoretical part and studies on comparison basis, which makes the practice better and easier. Welcome, Dr. Huda. Thank you so much, Aditi, for this opportunity, and I would also like to uh, thank your channel. And it's very overwhelming, and I really appreciate the efforts that all of you are putting in here. Thank you so much. The stage is all yours now. Thank you so much. I, uh, if uh, if you allow me to, I would like to wait for five more minutes for someone to join. Okay. Um, right. We can do that. And uh, meanwhile, uh, you can introduce yourself to everyone. My name is Dr. Hoda Nasar. Good morning, everyone. And I have completed my BDS recently. And all through my study uh, academic years, I, I have always adapted a policy of comparison and conceptual studying. I am not a very great fan of just memorizing things, but given that our field is all about how much you can contain and relate, uh, relate. That, uh, so you have to memorize a lot of stuff. But then again, if you uh, study it on a comparison basis, it becomes a lot more easier than just you know memorizing it. Because if you, um, when you compare it, you are able to connect the do dots um, whenever and wherever needed. Absolutely. Uh, thank you so much for being with us. And uh, I guess we can start with the session now. We are uh, streaming live. Okay, so uh, my topic today is radiographic diagnosis, and as I would say uh, that I believe any disease, any disease that any uh, disease uh, that we are uh, treating as the doctors really requires a correct and accurate diagnosis. And in dentistry, without radiographic intervention, it is very difficult to di uh, uh, difficult to diagnose a disease. And if you are not diagnosing it properly, you will never be able to uh, propose a proper treatment plan. Thereby. Uh, uh, radiographic diagnosis is of great importance in dentistry and so let's get started so here uh, are some of the contents uh, these are very brief we'll be discussing more of it uh, all through the presentation so uh, we'll be dealing with uh, lesions associated with the tooth and lesion associated with the bone before we get started uh, the major concept that we need to memorize or to realize here is that anything that has to be radiographically visible or of any radiographic importance should be associated with a calcified tissue only anything that is not properly calcified or uh, does not have any calcific content in it will not have any radiographic significance whatsoever we'll start with dental caries as we all know dental caries are um, uh, are progressing uh, bacterial uh, bacterial demineralization that happens on a tooth surface and uh, that could be uh, visible on intraoral film of the various kind now we have to uh, before we get started we have to also know that there are certain factors that if not kept in proper check may produce some radiolucent or some significant changes that may be misinterpreted as uh, something else so uh, the first thing is the peripheral burnout which could be misinterpreted as a cervical caries um, or the cemental caries and it could be reduced by decreasing exposure time or the voltage and the thing sorry to interrupt I'm sorry to interrupt, doctor. Your screen is not being shared. Okay, okay. I'll I'll just check it. Is it visible now? Uh, no. All right. I 
Um, can you see it now? Yes, absolutely. Please. Okay. So uh, we were talking about the uh, factors that could affect our interpretation and could uh, mimic uh, uh, other uh, prob other problems uh, such as the peripheral burnout here could also mimic cemental caries or the cervical caries. But the thing that you have to observe is that a peripheral burnout will be uh, will uh, will be constant and it will be observed in every tooth. Whereas cemental caries, uh, if there are any, will not be uh, observed in every tooth. Then we have ratio of enamel uh, to caries when X-ray photon uh, must, which X-ray photon must penetrate. That is that if the X-ray photon is not able to penetrate a, a calcified tissue, then it appears radiolucent. Whereas if it is properly able to pe um, pe uh, penetrate the tissue, it appears radio opaque. So in, uh, as in the picture, you can see some areas are radiolucent. That is because of the improper penetration of the photons. And then we have errors in angulations. We all know that if there is an uh, error in a vertical angulation, we will, it will uh, result in the foreshortening and elongation of the image and uh, the horizontal vertical uh, angulation uh, defect will uh, lead in the overlapping of the uh, uh, image. Then there are lesions that simulate dental caries but are not so. And those are basically observed whenever you are examining uh, a first maxillary premolar or a first mandibular premolar. A first maxillary premolar is associated with a mesial marginal groove, and first mandibular premolar is associated with a mesial, um, a mesial, um, a mesial developmental defect, which mimic a caries but they are not so, and they could be clinically differentiated from caries. Then we have cervical burnouts. The cervical burnouts is because there are uh, the area above and below the cervical area observe, uh, absorb more of the x-rays um, and thus they appear more radio opaque than the cervical area, which may be, which may be in a lot of cases, especially when you have, when you have given a crown to the patient. Sometimes when you take an OPG, you will see that the crown, um, um, below the crown, you'll observe a cervical radiolucency, which, we, which will be very apparent. Then you can mis also misinterpret that the tooth has been uh, infected and it is of no use, but you also need to uh, do an intervention and you will find out the tooth is perfectly healthy and this type of phenomenon is basically observed in, um, uh, in a tooth which is vital and has been given a crown or a bridge. Then we have uh, as a first uh, topic was interproximal caries. Interproximal caries or smooth surface caries are any demineralized lesion that appear on the lateral surface of the tooth where the con uh, where the tooth is at uh, the contact of the other tooth. And these lesions could be detected radiographically as well. So we'll start with the incipient lesion. Uh, as here, you can see that uh, in case one, there is a very, uh, in a very uh, small notching. This is an incipient lesion, but the enamel damage is about 50%, which is a very substantial and significant damage. So if there is any damage that is less than 50%, now it will uh, it is a hard to control, a hard to detect it on the radiograph. Now, as the caries progress, you could see it in this uh, picture that there is a triangular uh, lesion. Uh, this triangular lesion has a base towards the outer surface and the apex is towards the dentino enamel junction. Uh, the, these caries depict now the moderate caries where the uh, carious lesion is into the enamel completely but has not breached the dentino enamel junction. In case three, you can appreciate that uh, the uh, dentino enamel junction has been um, has is intact and the dentine still shows a radiolucency that means the caries has um, progressed into the dentine but the pattern still remains the same that is a triangular um, uh, the, the caries progress in triangular fashion where the base is towards the uh, dentino enamel junction and the apex is towards the uh, pulp chamber now once the uh, we can observe that once uh, the lesion is a uh, prog has progressed enough. The dentino enamel junction now breaks down, and the entire lesion becomes one. And uh, sometimes when we are examining it clinically, we tend to break the this entire uh, dentino enamel junction, and we could explore that there is a lot more carious portion lying inside. But it is um, uh, more visible and more evident in a radiograph. 
these dentinal uh, the uh, smooth surface caries now follow the path of the dentinal tubule and they'll approach the pulp you can appreciate this in this picture where you can see a proximal lesion and that um, proceeds um, towards the pulp chamber now why you can also ask that it doesn't go anywhere but it uh, directly come to the pulp horn that is because the vitality of the tooth is brought there and the dentinal tubules that the caries the pathogens are following and lead to the pulp chamber then we have an incipient lesion as i said earlier anything uh, about 50% will mark an incipient lesion and anything less than that will not be uh, will not appear on a radiograph and it is very sometimes it is very hard to appreciate so an incipient lesion is only uh, of uh, good use um, when we have a good radiograph then we have a moderate lesion as said uh, as said earlier <clears throat> Um, more than 50% of the enamel up to the DEJ, but not breaching the DEJ. And then we have an advanced interproximal lesion where we can see the DEJ, ha DEJ has been breached. Uh, dentine is involved and there is a radiolucency involved in the dentine as uh, the arrows could depict. Here is the lesion. Now we have a severe interproximal lesion, which is not very hard to differentiate. You can also differentiate it clinically. You don't need a radiograph for that. But to uh, see what an, uh, to what extent the caries have progressed, that's where the radiograph comes into play. And that's where you will have your treatment plan. You can also go for uh, excavation and review. And sometimes the teeth is uh, uh, pretty much restorable. And, uh, and a lot of times it goes into a root canal treatment. So here we have a uh, extensive lesion. Now coming to the occlusal caries. Occlusal caries, the first radiographic sign is a dark line between enamel and dentine. Occasionally, occlusal caries is confused with buccal and lingual caries, but it could be differentiated clinically. Now, if you could appreciate that this is a lesion, here we can see this is a lesion. The intact enamel is not that has not suffered that much, but the dentine has severely suffered. And if you could appreciate, we could also see histologic areas of the dental caries. Uh, for more specific radiograph, you can see here that uh, the lesion has started as a pit over the enamel, but as you get deep into it, you will see there is a very extensive lesion which is reaching to the dentine and might also reach to the pulp. Now, incipient occlusal caries cannot be appreciated on a radiograph and you need an explorer or you, uh, you will find that they are not that deep, so they do not have any radiographic significance there. We have moderate occlusal caries. The pattern of uh, occlusal caries is this. The, uh, there is a very small lesion in the enamel, but it is highly affected uh, below the DEJ. And as we uh, could uh, see that the apex is toward, is the opposite, the, uh, the fashion of progression is opposite to the smooth surface or the interproximal caries. Here, the triangular base is towards the DEJ and the apex is towards the outer surface. So there is a lot more DEJ, um, uh, DEJ damage, or there is a lot more dentinal damage than the, uh, than the enamel damage. Uh, therefore, um, before proceeding for any treatment, it is very uh, important that you take a radiograph of the tooth so that you have your treatment plan ready. And severe occlusal caries are very much visible on clinical aspect also, but sometimes uh, we may um, tend to go for a root canal where the, when the teeth is restorable. And that only could be made out if you take a radiograph as such, uh, like you can see here, the teeth is pretty much restorable. We can go for excavation and review. But uh, if you don't have a radiograph, uh, when you see such a deep lesion on a tooth, uh, your first intention is to go for a root canal treatment. Then we have buccal and lingual caries. They are very much visible and could be differentiated uh, on the um, could be differentiated clinically. But on radiograph, you could also observe the lesion only if it is a too deep lesion, and there will be a radiolucent spot on the dentine. Now we have cemental caries. As I said earlier, peripheral burnouts could be also misinterpreted as cemental caries. Cementum has a very low calcium and a very high fluoride content, but uh, which also make it very resilient. So if you have a uh, cemental caries, it is very much, uh, there could be a very much likeliness that the patient is suffering from uh, a periodontal disease as well. There will be a significant bone loss and you could also observe recession in such patient. And it does not occur in areas covered by a well-attached gingival. 
saliva. So it may be confused with cervical burnout, as I said earlier. So you have to differentiate it because uh, the mental case will not be uniformly observed, whereas the peripheral burnout will be uniformly observed in all the two. As I uh, told you earlier, cervical burnouts are because the uh, uh, the structure that is the root uh, and the crown both have observed more of the radiation so they appear more radio opaque thus making it uh, make the cervical area look radio lucid uh, and this could be misinterpreted especially when a tooth has a crown when a vital tooth has a crown this is the condition you could um, uh, pretty much observe uh, you could uh, very efficiently observe in your clinics where the patient comes with the pain and you take an OPG and then you see that there is a significant radio lucency this is because the uh, the crown is of porcelain and metal and it is very very much radio opaque thus observing most of the radiations thus observing most of the radiation rendering the cervical area pretty much radio lucent which appears pathologic but is not now we have rampant caries. Rampant caries is a type of early childhood caries and uh, it is marked by uh, lesions in 10 or more tooth in a con um, con uh, in one or more consecutive years and uh, they are basically because of very poor oral hygiene in the uh, in children and also because of hypoplasia but the cases of hypoplasia appearing in clinic are pretty much less you could see that the patient who have these soothers uh, who have a habit of giving their children uh, soothers and uh, who have a habit of sleeping with the uh, with the feeders in their mouth they mostly have, uh, come to clinic with uh, such kind of lesions for the treatment plan yes a radiographic intervention is uh, necessary but for but uh, for the diagnosis you could also diagnose it clinically now we have radiation caries radiation caries are basically of three type uh, this is the initial lesion this is a type 1 lesion where the cervical areas are heavily affected and to make a note here it is i would also say that uh, any patient that come to you uh, and gives a history of radiation you will observe you might uh, you will observe that the teeth are heavily heavily uh, carious and um, uh, you cannot uh, you cannot go for composites uh, very easily in these uh, in such kind of two and uh, the lesions are uh, uniform and it also depend upon the uh, uh, the duration of radiation they have received these uh, cervical lesions may also lead to complete um, complete detachment of the crowns from the root and further um, uh, other complications of radiation could also be observed now we have secondary or recurrent caries. Secondary or recurrent caries appear when there is a restoration uh, and below that radio restoration, you can see a very well defined, uh, very defined radio lucency. Uh, it, the margins are not well defined, but you could, uh, you could appreciate the contrast between the radio opacity of the um, a restoration and the radio lucency of the recurrent lesion. As in here, you can see in this premolar, the radio opacity of the restoration and the radio lucency of the uh, recurrent caries. So it is very um, observe. Uh, it is very observable and um, clinically it is not visible. But only if you take a radiograph because the restoration has covered the defect. Uh, thereby, a radiograph is a must in the case of recurrent caries. Then we have pulp exposure. Pulp exposures are uh, clinically also could be appreciated, but radiographically you have a more um, 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 better view to uh, the condition. And uh, clinically, if while doing the procedure, um, iatrogenically you have induced the pulp exposure, then it would be uh, looking somewhat, uh, it would be looking like this, the bleed uh, from the tooth surface. Now we have developmental pits. Developmental pits, dense and dente, and um, all of these conditions may give you a sense of uh, uh, may give you a sense uh, that the tooth is um, radiographically uh, not fine. But then again, uh, your diagnosis should be based on a complete balance of your clinical findings and your radiographical findings. You should not completely rely, rely on clinical uh, findings and should not completely rely on radiographic finding it is very important that um, uh, even if though you have uh, seen the radiograph you still observe the tooth uh, and the condition of the tooth and then only plan your treatment plan 
we have fluoride bombs fluoride bombs are very common uh, very commonly seen uh, in certain areas and uh, the the knack of these of this lesion is that the tooth appear perfectly healthy this is because the fluoride that has been um, uh, that uh, that has been acting on the tooth does not make it look like uh, um, uh, like uh, carious but in each, uh, but the, but deep down it is heavily carious and it could be only observed um, primarily on the radiographs and uh, or you go for um, clinical intervention that is you open up the tooth and you will see a massive decayed lesion and similar uh, similar case could be uh, studied in uh so could it could be studied uh, in arrested caries form uh, but the here it is opposite there is a carious lesion but it is not progressing and sometimes clinically you will see there is a white chalky spot um, which appears radiolucent on the radiograph but um, it's not progressing anywhere coming to the periapical radiolucencies the common pathologic condition we have here are granuloma cyst and abscess which you will observe um, on a routine basis in your clinics so um, also um, when you go for a clinic a periapical radiograph when you are observing the periapical area you have to look for the anatomic structures such as in mandible the mental foramen and the incisor foramen the uh, mental foramen could uh, here like in this picture you could appreciate this area now this could um, appear this would appear to you like it's some defect but it is not it is a mental foramina uh, and uh, in maxilla similarly you will find line of any sometimes the maxillary lining is so close that it um, you may um, think of it as a lesion but it is not so you should know how to differentiate between an anatomic structure and a lesion now we have a periapical radiolucencies so superimposition of radiolucent normal anatomic structures like mental foramen and maxillary sinus in pure dental canal here we have the mental foramen and here we have the maxillary sinus the thing that you need to observe here is if there would be any lesion it would be associated with the tooth or it will be around the tooth it will not um, be something lying in the space so if there is something just lying in the space it needs more intervention but some but for these lesions you to you should be very thorough like uh, this is the premolar space now the mental foramina is said to found to be found in the premolar space area so your uh, your uh, first thought should not be something like very invasive but a basic one and here it is again the premolar and the molar line uh, we know that the maxillary sinus dip we, we study in anatomy that the maxillary sinus dip uh, in between the roots of the first molar and the second molar so this should be this should be um, a common finding for you and uh, you as you observe more and more radiograph you will be able to differentiate with a proper periapical lesion that really requires an invasion and the anatomic structures then we have incomplete root formation incomplete root formation is uh, seen in ch children in the mixed deciduous uh, dentation period and it uh, is marked by blunderbuss apex so this should not be a problem for any uh, any of us because uh, blunderbuss apex are um, the open apex and should be um, and should be appreciated on a mixed dentation radiogram now here we have a cyst a granuloma and abscess now these three cases are something that you will you you'll routinely you observe and you will have to go for an intervention now in first test you can see the size will greater than will be greater than 1 cm and the margins will be very well defined here you can observe the margins are very well defined and the size is obviously greater than 1 cm for a granuloma the size will be mm, less than 1 cm and it will have a very well defined margins around the apex of the tooth so here you can see the lesion is smaller than the cyst it is less than 1 cm and the margins are very well defined and in abscess the margins will not be well defined it will be merging with the uh, surrounding bone but you could or uh, you can appreciate the radiolucency you can appreciate the obliteration of the periodontal space you can appreciate the obliteration of the lamina dura as well so here now the treatment plan um, changes for every um, of these lesions so you need to be very thorough and the thing that is uh, um, there uh, all of them are associated with a non vital tooth
Now we have cementoblastoma, which is also a common finding. And the knack about cementoblastoma is that it has a halo-like appearance. And uh, that is that the radial opaque area is then is now surrounded by a radial lucent area, which gives it a halo-like appearance. Like here, the radial opaque area is now surrounded by a radial lucent area, giving it a halo-like appearance, and it is associated closely associated obliterating completely obliterating the periodontal space. So it uh, could be said as period. Uh, cementoblastoma. Then we have periodontal space thickening. It is it could be pathologic in the case of tooth extrusion. That is the trauma, and the tooth has been extruded. Uh, extruded, so uh, you will have uh, periodontal space thickening. Root resorption, resorption of lamina dura. Resorption of lamina dura occurs when the tooth is diseased. That is, there are there are caries or there is periodontitis uh, or initial symptoms of osteomyelitis and, uh, and trauma can also uh, depict the uh, thickening of the periodontal space. Uh, the non-pathologic could be observed where in the developmental stages of the dentition as in the mixed period and in the initial primary dentition phase where you will not be able to appreciate a, uh, where you will not be able to appreciate a periodontal space because it has not the periodontal, periodontal fibers are not, are not yet formed uh, therefore it will see a thickening or uh, obliteration of the space. Now we have root end changes that is hypersementosis which is very which might be commonly observed it is basically observed in patient who are very aged and uh, uh, it is also observed in patient uh, who have uh, who have this uh, um, uh, bruxism problems uh, the tooth uh, which is uh, which is not physiologically significant or is not physi physiologically used can also depict hypersementosis then we have root resorption there is a smooth root resorption or rough root resorption rough root resorptions are seen in the cases of uh, abscesses when you will extract the tooth in, uh, in cases of abscess when you will extract the tooth you will observe the, the root ends are very rough that is because of the irregular uh, uh, resorption that has taken place in chronic generalized periodontitis mostly if you observe that patient um, when the tooth is extracted the root uh, surface is very rough and that is because of the concavities that are, that has been produced during the resorption. Then smooth root resorption is also physio can also be observed in physiologic resorption. And in many uh, cyst cases and uh, tumor cases, there is a uh, smooth uh, root resorption. Then we have bone changes associated with apical alteration. We have all heard about condensing osteitis, and it is a very common finding. It is associated with the root. Apex, and it is an uh, immune response of the body that, that helps in buttressing of the bone against a trauma or infection and it could be observed uh, very close to the apex and there is a very de uh, um, uh, defined ra uh, radio opaque lesion with irregular margins but it could be very well appreciated uh, in the radiograph. Now we have ankylosis. The tooth that is more highly ankylosed is the second molar, second uh, deciduous mandibular molar. And uh, how will you know that the tooth is ankylosed clinically is by when you um, percuss the tooth, it will give you a metallic sound and uh, a definitive diagnosis can be made by a radiographic intervention. Here you can see the roots are completely fused with the surrounding bone and there is a uh, complete obliteration. Complete obliteration of the periodontal space. Then we have periodontal diseases. In the incipient, in the incipient periodontal diseases, what you have to observe are three main points is the triangulation, that is widening of periodontal space at the crest of interproximal bone. That is, this, uh, a, this area should be completely filled with a bone but it is not so if this is there that means there is a bone loss and uh, it is a very incipient lesion therefore uh, it is only limited to the cej it is it has not gone beyond the cej so it, uh, it is an incipient periodontal lesion where you can observe clinically gingival bleed um gingival bleeding and uh, patient on uh, localized bleeding could also be there and patient uh, will basically come to you um with a and they complain of gingival bleed and there will be other uh, local factors observed that such as uh, calculus yeah then we have uh, an overhanging restoration could also cause uh, uh, the uh, bone resorption interproximally but it will not be on a generalized level so locally you will uh, see when there is 
overhanging restoration. Then we have crestal irregularities that is slightly more opaque alveolar crest with irregular appearance, edged or irregular appearance, which could be observed here. Here you can see the, the there's the smoothness, the uniformity has gone and the, there is an irregularity. And then we have alveolar bone changes that could be observed. Now for advanced periodontal diseases, advanced periodontal diseases could be clinically um, observed, but for a treatment plan to be proposed, you need to understand how much bone loss is there. And if there has to be a surgical intervention, how much uh, of, uh, of that you need and uh, if, whether you need grafts or not. And if you place the graft, whether they'll be successful or not, successful or not, for all of these prognoses, you need a radiograph. Radiographically, um, um, as we all know, gingivitis leads to periodontitis and periodontitis is basically marked by recessions and uh, mobilities and migrations. And radiogra radiographically, a chronic lesion will appear so that is the bone will appear um, uh, complete, uh, uh, to a large extent resolved and uh, there will be a horizontal bone loss in, ca in case of a generalized periodontitis. Now, uh, if you want to calculate the bone loss, uh, you can also calculate it radiographically, but it is more significant uh, clinically. So as we all know, below CEJ, there is 1 to 1.5, the alveolar crest is 1 to 1 1.5 mm below the CEJ. So you'll measure the probe, uh, probing length, and um, then um, whatever your probing length will be, you'll minus, uh, you'll be adding. 1 mm to 1.5 mm, that will give you uh, an, a measure of your bone loss. Then we have direction of bone loss. As said earlier, if there is a vertical bone loss, there is a localized case, and then you can find some irritating factors also. It need not to be a periodontitis every time. Mm, uh, for a localized case, there are overhanging restoration, there are irritating factors, and so and so. And for a horizontal bone loss, the, the lesion is generalized and might or might not be chronic, but it is a generalized lesion. Here, for vertical cases, you can see that the malaligned teeth, especially, uh, which do not. Um, that do not um, that people are do not able to clean properly or brush properly will depict a vertical vertical bone loss as uh, here that we can appreciate whereas here it is not so vertical bone loss is um, basically associated with a uh, local thing now detection of local uh, irritating factors local irritating factors could be calculus or overhanging restoration both of which you could appreciate radiographically calculus could be seen as a radio opaque mass which is not very well defined which is not very well defined and it's also visible only in people with very heavy um, calculus calculus uh, so uh, it will appear around the neck of the tooth now we have tooth resorptions there are physiological resorptions are when the tooth are shedding off and the resorption is pretty much smooth and then we have idiopathic, uh, idiopathic uh, where we do not know where the external um, uh, external internal resorption can occur and we cannot make out properly whether uh, we cannot make out the reason why the resorption is happening. And uh, here, radiograph is very important, especially such kind of resorptions are internally stimulated. And especially in deciduous tooth, you can observe this because of the, um, because of the polarity of the cell changes uh, very often. We then we have pathologic tooth resorption. This could be here the case is the mesoangular impaction, which, which is leading to the resorption of the distal root of the mandibular second molar. So uh, it is very commonly observed in impacted teeth, especially age. Sometimes you will find that the teeth, the, the, uh, the, um, uh, the wisdom to the teeth is not visible clinically, but when you take an OPG, you will observe that it has um, progressed a lot and it has lead to the resorption of not just this root of the second molar, but in some cases it could also be, it could also progress and lead to the resorption of many other teeth. And then again, we have infection as we have discussed earlier in the cases of abscess, there will be a rough, um, a rough root resorption. And then neoplasma in cases of tumors and cysts, root resorption is very common and reported. And in trauma, there is root resorption. Then we have pulp calcification. Pulp calcification is uh, also a natural phenomenon for the, uh, for aged people. So if you are dealing with a patient with a good age, you'll uh, you'll appreciate you can appreciate it is not definitive, but you can pretty much appreciate uh, pulp calcification such as here. 
the premolar pulp space is calcified and there is a very thin line that could be seen and here also uh, the pulp calcification can, can be seen then we have secondary dentine secondary dentine is formed uh, it, it keeps forming over your lifetime and again uh, such phenomena are mostly reported in a patient with a of good age uh, so the pulp chamber or the pulp space is very narrow and when you're pro progressing with the root canal treatment you have to be very sure uh, about uh, you have to be very affirmative about the root canal positions you have to be very affirmative about your treatment plan then we have dentinal bridges. Uh, this is a tertiary dentine case that has been reported. Here you can see that this tertiary dentine has formed as a response to the um, progression uh, as a uh, progression of dental caries. But such a type of dentinal bridges could also be induced uh, during our uh, direct pulp capping and indirect pulp capping procedures. Then we have pulp obliteration. It is uh, it is very commonly observed in the patient and the older patients and the mandibular, especially in the mandibular uh, anteriors. You could um, the uh, pulp uh, pulp chambers thin uh, with age, but um, since the mandibular anteriors already have a very thin pulp chambers, so the effect is more rapidly observed in these teeth. Then we have tooth fracture. Fracture line and discontinuity in the outline of the tooth are the most usually observed sign of fracture. Fracture is anything that is discontinuous than the normal. It must be remembered that the radiogram can have an appearance that simulates a fracture and fracture segment and it could be superimposed in a manner that hides the fracture. Multiple views of the questionable area ordinarily resolve such difficulties. So here the point is that you can observe fractures but sometimes you will not be able to especially in the posterior teeth um, and there might be some radiographic um, radiographic failures that will lead uh, that will imitate a fracture but uh, will not be so. Now we have erosion, abrasion, adhesion. They do not usually require a radiographic uh, radiographic intervention unless you are treating the um, affected teeth. But then uh, you can also appreciate such changes because anything that changes uh, the calcific structure will be definitely will definitely be observed on a radiograph. And with this, we come to the end of our uh, presentation. I have mostly discussed the very common, uh, very common uh, lesion that you will observe in your clinics. And I've not got in, uh, not uh, got too deep into any uh, thing. Uh, but uh, for these lesions, which are very regular and routine on clinics, um, it is very important that you um, uh, that you properly observe and uh, make a diagnosis. Because once you have a proper treatment plan, you will be confident and. And the chances of failure will be a lot less. So with this, I thank you all for joining in and uh, opening the house for questions. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, doctor. And uh, as you said, that half of the uh, treatment is done once the diagnosis is on point. So yeah. uh, your recession was absolutely great. And I'm sure that all the practitioners and all our uh, participants would have gained a lot after your session. So I request all the participants, if you have any doubts, you can drop your questions in the question and answer box or you can comment so that we can uh, take up your questions. So before moving on to the question and answer session, I would like to introduce our uh, participants to our organization. So this is our organization, Dentist Channel Online, with the motto, Healthy Smiles That Leads to Wealthy Lives. I request all the participants to kindly log on to our uh, new, brand new website, www.dentistchannel.online. You can find us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, LinkedIn, YouTube, WhatsApp, and Telegram as well, with the handle, dentist, at the rate, Dentist Channel Online. So we are proud to say that we are the first digital dental marketing media company in India, which caters to academic, professional and commercial needs of dental yes. students, practitioners, organization, businesses, dental industry leaders. We offer several services and variety of platform under one roof. So uh, like we conduct a lot of webinars, a lot of workshop for the dental professional and students for organization. We do graphic designing, marketing, website development, and much more. And becoming a prime member oh. will avail you a lot of benefits. So let's uh, check out on the benefits. 
you'll get all the free access to the dental webinars and you'll be getting e certificate for each and every each and every webinar that you attend only after you subscribe to our prime membership you'll get special discounts on our master class sessions courses workshop hands on trainings you can build a great network with the the with the colleagues and uh, different uh, dental practitioners which are uh, living in the different parts of the country and the world so the annual membership will cost you just 799 rupees and uh, if you're using the promo oh. code adp100 that is my promo code so you'll avail a, a short discount on the uh, annual fee so i request all the uh, participants who have joined us kindly subscribe to our prime membership using my promo code adp100 so uh, i would like to uh, inform you that uh, Uh, we have two more sessions today uh, at 5 o'clock we have management of mandibular condylar fracture through an intra oral approach using a transbuccal trochlear with ramus buccal decortication a retrospective study by dr shreya and holistic dentistry homeopathic remedies for common dental problems with dr dennis at 7 pm so uh, we are coming with the, our online 3 hour master class for uh, a traumatic extraction techniques you'll be learning all the latest techniques which involves uh, a traumatic extraction the clinical implications there will be case studies there will be question and answer session one on one mentorship will be there by dr kushal gangwani and we have just limited seats now so i request everyone to kindly subscribe to it soon in the in the month of march we are coming with three online workshops first we are starting with forensic odontology batch 3 after the huge success of batch 1 and 2 we are coming this year with batch 3 so kindly subscribe to our prime uh, i'm sorry for the online workshop and prime membership uh, because uh, once you subscribe to the prime membership you will get uh, added discounts to the workshop as well on 6th of march uh, we are coming with online master class on communication the key to success for the key to a successful dental practice by dr jayana gandhi and uh, on uh, 13th of march we are coming with uh, the art of interpreting the different shades of gray basically radiographic uh, diagnosis and interpretation which we read today as well so uh, kindly uh, subscribe to our uh, workshops and for any latest update uh, if you want our latest update you have to subscribe to our uh, you have to send one text message containing your name on this uh, number and uh, on whatsapp and you'll be added to our broadcast list and you'll be updated regarding each and every upcoming event that we have so our sponsor nova mind gmbh uh, they have innovative dental and healthcare solutions to ensure your success in implants for the recorded video if uh, in any case you have missed out any of our live session you can go back and watch our recorded videos on facebook and youtube and uh, you can uh, join us on instagram for the latest updates with the handle dental channel online uh, let's start with the question and answer session okay the first question is from dr saroj she is asking uh, please explain the difference between granuloma and abscess abscess causes swelling why granuloma and cyst goes undetected granuloma and cyst goes undetected uh, because unless there is a cortical bone expansion you will not be able to observe a cyst because of the because our immune response whenever there is an abscess that turn that abscess when is counted with our immune response now uh, turns into a granuloma and if the granuloma is not treated then it turns into a cyst so it is so you will see that it is a um, uh, event it is a event followed by uh, first step second step and third step so when there is an initial step a body is not able to overcome that uh, problem so the abscess is very painful to the patient and you could observe it clinically but at uh, as it is substantiated with our immune response it turns into a granuloma thus uh, you could not different uh, clinically you cannot differentiate between abscess and a granuloma unless you have a radiographic intervention right so uh, i guess uh, dr saroj has uh, got her 
uh, query cleared. So uh, before ending the session, Dr. Uh, Nassar, do you have any, how, uh, any takeaway note for our participants? I would just say that, uh, uh, you know, you, you, you in nowadays you don't find, it's very hard to be a good doctor, I would say. So always strive to be a good doctor. Always do not look onto the financial aspect too much. Do not think about, uh, you know, that um, obviously if you do a RC, you'll cater a more financial benefit. But um, always think about the patient. Always, uh, you know, be a good doctor in every aspect, not just the diagnosis, not just the treatment plan, but a good doctor to your patient as well. Absolutely. With this note, uh, we'll end our today's session. Thank you so much, Dr. Nisar, for coming with us. Thank you so much to all the participants for joining us. So uh, stay tuned for our more uh, sessions uh, for the day at 5 p.m. and 7 p.m. So uh, see you then. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. Take care. Thank you so much.